I'm going to I'm joined today by Tom Yoram, also from the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, who's going to be talking about a lot of a lot of the proposal materials and our resources at the ALCF. And also not Dima Bikoff, um, we've got Mark Barrel, who's actually the deputy direct uh, deputy program manager for Insight, and he's going to be talking about the OLCF resources and some other parts of how to write the narrative for your proposal. So as I mentioned, we're going to really try to help you learn how to write a, a proposal for Insight. Um, really, when you're doing that, you're targeting, you know, trying to successfully get a significant sized allocation from the DOE's leadership computing facilities. We're going to describe all of the proposal sections and give you a sense of what we're looking for. And, um, and really sort of, you know, even sort of give a sense of of how those fit together into the review process. For the timeline, I'm I'm really you know happy that people are here today. We had another webinar last week because this is earlier than normal, and our goal here was to try to answer questions early on. We will have other opportunities to ask questions of the program team. You can always mail us. Um, we hope to have a, a Q and A session closer to when proposals are due as well. But the primary thing is that new proposals are due June 16th, um, and that's a pretty hard deadline. So, so consider that pretty seriously. The renewals, and you know you're a renewal because you already have an insight proposal, and, and you will only be only those people who've been invited to submit a renewal may submit a renewal. Those are due later. Those are due July 21st. PIs will be notified of the results of the process in November of this year for awards that will be available starting January 1st of 2024. All right, so as I mentioned, there are new and renewal proposals. They are fundamentally really similar, um, but, but the big difference is that, you know, for a new proposal, this is someone who either does not have an active proposal or their current proposal is ending. And um, and with that, you can ask for one, two, or three years. For a renewal proposal, this is what this is a, a renewal. A renewal proposal is for a PI who has an active allocation in Insight right now, and the the award originally given was for multiple years. I have already reached out to those who are eligible in 2024 for renewals. And for the, I will get into details. Those are slightly different, mostly for the renewal. We're looking to make sure that a project is staying on track. So this is the quick outline today. I'm going to give an overview for Insight to give you some context of, of you know, ins and outs and, and new things and, and et cetera. But then we're going to dive closer into the details about the systems themselves and the sections of the proposal and have a quick Q and A for anything that we haven't answered during the course of the talk. Uh, a few things that are changes or newer things within the the Insight Award process. There is a proposal development support option. This is something that will be open for the most part around the year around year round. It is meant to be a, another mechanism to plug into the resources that the facilities already offer. Like if you need to have a sit down conversation or perhaps you feel like you need some, some level of collaboration or, or help from the facilities, this is a way to sort of get that plug in uh, and get help uh, in, in developing a proposal. We introduced this last year, but this is uh, the next thing is, is something I wanted to mention again. Those writing proposals are able to request access to the test bed systems at Argonne. So at Argonne, we have the AI test bed, and this is an open system anyone can apply against. The same at the OLCF, they have the quantum test bed, which is something anyone can apply for and account for. You do not need to request this through Insight. This is not you know, a good thing or a bad thing for your proposal, but if you feel like there's something tangential to your proposal or related to your proposal, that would be really interesting to explore in those test beds, you may check that and, and we can follow up with, with access. And finally, a reminder um, for those who are new, just as a note that all components of the proposal will be in a single PDF when you're submitting. So to dive in a little bit on the test bed resources, what I want to emphasize is that these are not big systems. 
They're exploring new types of hardware that are coming out in either the AI space or in the quantum computing space. They are small. The whole point here is really exploring that hardware and exploring what that hardware can do. In some cases, exploring what that hardware can do in conjunction with the other resources at the facility. So this is this is not you know a, a place where you'll be requesting huge amounts of time. It's really an exploratory system. The systems we will be awarding insight on in 2024 are Polaris at the ALCF. So this is the resource that was available previously. Frontier, uh, that's the exascale system at OLCF. And Aurora, which is the exascale system at the ALCF. Aurora will be awarded for 2024, and we expect that we will see time available in the second half of the year. Okay, a very quick, bigger picture background is that Insight is the way we deliver our mission as national user facilities. So the ALCF and OLCF, the leadership computing facility as a whole is a national user facility, which means that we have a mission to deliver very large scale computational and data resources for open science. To deliver that mission, Insight is, is the program and we award up to 60% of the systems to Insight, 60% of the time on those systems in the Insight program. There is also the ALCC program. So this is run by our sponsors in the Department of Energy and the Office of Science, OSCAR. And this is the 30% that's under their control. They do a separate call every year called the ALCC call, <laughs> excuse me, that runs at six months offset from Insight. So for example, those projects start in Gen July 1st of 2024. Additionally, this is where the Exascale Computing Project gets their chunk of time to, to make their project successful. Finally, there is the Director's Discretionary. It's a very relevant section of time to discuss today because as projects are developing Insight proposals and potentially ALCC proposals, Really, we direct everyone to make sure that they have a director's discretionary. It allows you to get the best data possible for your proposal. It is fast, it is easy. These are not very onerous asks. Um, they are small awards, but it's where you can test everything out and get, and get moving and see just what the ins and outs of using the facilities are. So what exactly is Insight? The the premise behind Insight is to promote transformational advances in science and technology through large allocations of compute time, data, data resources, human resources. The idea is that we are trying to award 10 to 100 times the compute capability you would be able to get access to at any other facility out there. But primarily, the goal is to search for really those transformational projects, those ones that are going to have a very large impact on their field of study. Impact can be defined, by the way, in many ways, and that includes, you know, by generating data sets, generating results, you know, creating a tool, um, very broad definition of impact. I will say that there is no specific domain that is, is um, tied into accessing insight or set of domains set into accessing insight. We have a very broad range of domains that are successful and that apply against the program. We see changes in that on an almost yearly basis. Um, clearly we have some, some fields that are very commonly represented, but we also see new ones that come in and out. I think the other thing that's really valuable to understand about insight is that there's no quota like, so we're not trying to make sure that X percent of the systems come from chemistry or biology. There's no quota based on domain. In addition to that, uh, there's no requirement that there is a mission priority, whether it's DOE mission priority or anybody else's mission priority. It's really just looking for high impact science. So there's three criteria fundamentally that you need to meet in order to ask for an insight award. The first one is your merit criteria, really. So when you're being evaluated, this is, this is the primary thing that matters. So it's looking for research campaigns with significant impact on your domain or your community, as I've already mentioned. 
The second one is that this is work you could not do anywhere else. So we're looking for computationally or data, um, data demanding types of work, right, that you would not be able to execute elsewhere. This could be even that there's architectural components of the systems that really are unique that you need to use to, to, to execute your work. And as I mentioned, uh, anyone is eligible to apply. Grant allocations are awarded regardless of funding source, regardless of sort of mission orientation, and non-US based researchers are absolutely welcome to apply. So I'll talk a little bit about the twofold review process because Insight does have a twofold review process. As I mentioned, and I'm going to stick to it and I'm going to repeat it 100 times in this, in this webinar, the primary and most important part of the review process is your scientific and technical merit. So is this a high impact proposal? Are you trying to tackle this in an appropriate way, given the methods that you're going to use? Do you have good milestones? So is it believable that you can actually get to your target goal? Is it the right team to do this work? Is the amount of resource reasonable, right? So is this reasonable given the type of problem I want to study? Is this reasonable given the methods I'm using? Or have you significantly you know, misjudged how much time you might need to move things forward? So that's really the peer review on a new proposal. Those are the types of questions we're asking. Those are the most crucial things for you to consider putting into scope when you're writing your proposal. Secondly, a new proposal goes through a computational readiness review. This is done by the facilities. It is done as, as effectively a risk assessment. So how ready are you to run? Will it take you a long time to get going? Are you already completely there? And it gives us a better sense of how capable this project will be. It is normally not the deciding factor, although it can influence decisions. So if you are very highly rated, but completely incapable of using the facilities, like you haven't done any testing uh, or haven't proven your case, that's an extreme, right? And there might even be conversations about that. It might be a very hard choice, but for the most part, this is, this is a risk assessment in moving forward. The renewals, as I already alluded to, have a slightly different set of questions going to the peer review committee. Now, the goal with a renewal assessment is, are you on target? So you submitted a proposal in your for your very first year of an award that had a scientific target that had milestones and are you staying on target to some degree with you know there's obviously some degree of of wiggle room right because things change answers come in and you might have to change change direction a little bit but fundamentally have you changed large amounts of scope within your project if you are a renewal project and you are worried about whether you have changed scope, reach out to me and, and we will have a conversation to that and I can give you some guidance. Um, and similarly, on the computational review on renewals, we're mostly making sure that they're meeting their technical milestones, that they're computationally on track and understanding the ins and outs there of any problems they might have. All of that information feeds into the award committee. So that is made up of the directors for the two facilities, the Insight Program Manager, me, the that's me, the directors of science for the two facilities, and then other asked and other members of our management teams are folded into that. So there are some restrictions, and some of these are harder than other restrictions, but fundamentally, we have cybersecurity plans that does bound and types of data that we can have on the systems. So if you have got sensitive data of any sort, to be frank, I would say reach out to us early just to make sure that we can manage it. But things that are, are really difficult to fold into the enclave that includes the big leadership computing systems, things like PII, export controlled information, classified information, you know, these types of things, right, are, are big flags for us. It does not mean you have no hope. I really encourage people to reach out and talk to us if they believe they have things that fall under these. There's a lot of different ways we have managed this historically, okay? But it is something to really keep in mind. These are open science machines and, and the level of lockdown is different than, than in other places. Similar, but kind of related to that, right, is proprietary use and proprietary information on the systems. So as I've already said a few times, we are a national user facility. So we are committed to open science. 
the, the cost to you to get an award on our time is that we expect that those results will be published and that they will be publicly available at some point. So for proprietary use, if work is going to stay out of the public domain, there is a full cost recovery program that both facilities have. Again, this falls into the category of totally possible and it's happened before, but please talk to me before you submit the proposal. <laughs> And and, um, and and mostly that just makes sure that we have all our ducks in a row. This is not the dominant mechanism by which uh, for, for, for our projects through the Insight program. But as I said, it has been done, but we often find actually more effective ways to, to manage your project than keeping it completely proprietary. All right. There's a historical thing that I want to touch on, and this is the issue of community proposals and umbrella proposals, and I will define what I mean by that. We as a program encourage community proposals, although we have more issues with umbrella proposals. And with a community proposal, here we're talking about something where you have a community, they have come together, they have agreed on a, perhaps a grand challenge problem or a particular path of research in order to solve a problem. So they have a consensus and they're working together and they're coordinating their plan. Those types of proposal, proposals are encouraged. And I think it's even clearer what I mean by a community proposal when I contrast that with an umbrella proposal. An umbrella proposal is really, you can think of this as having multiple different scientific goals put together into one proposal, perhaps to make sure it's asking for enough time to merit an insight proposal, or, or perhaps it's just the PI wants to work on these five things, right? But there's multiple reasons why they might be an umbrella proposal. But between, say, those five things, there's not necessarily a clear link or an obvious reason why they're put, pulled together. They could each individually be an insight proposal in terms of the scientific research going on. The reason those are hard is, is if you consider what I just said, that you could take one of those parts of the proposal out and write a full insight proposal about it. And what our review panels often find is that they, they've run into this exact thing, right? That they have an umbrella proposal, which has a problem and another as one of its five problems. And then an insight proposal that has one of those five as a full proposal. And so they're really uh, in a in a bind because they don't have enough information about each one of those five things in the umbrella proposal to do an effective review, and and it is almost unfair right to both that umbrella proposal and to say the proposals that are doing a deep dive on a particular line of research. So we have found this flavor of proposal really problematic, uh, not impossible but problematic. And this also goes back if you think you might fall under an, an umbrella proposal. I would say reach out um, and we can talk about that and see whether it actually does fall under that category or whether there's even a way of articulating what the proposal is doing that helps sort of paint that larger big picture that might help it not be explicitly an umbrella proposal. All right, shifting gears a touch, some award statistics to give you, um, I apologize, quick, quick fingers, uh, to give you a sense of what the kind of numbers look like. In 2023, so the current Insight projects that, that are running this year, we closed that call on June 17th. The ALCF and OLCF resources were about two times oversubscribed based on requests. Now that was low, that's low compared to history. So normally that number is really in the three to five. That's like, the, it was a low ask last year uh, overall. So consider that a little bit abnormal and think about, you know, those, those numbers are going to be higher moving forward. So 60% of the time was awarded, um, including Summit and Theta, and 50% of the time on Polaris, which was the emerging system at the ALCF. There were 56 total projects, nine of them were renewals. And, and the breakdown of where PIs were homed is, is really consistent with history. We've got about six, last year was 62% that came from universities. That's very similar, somewhere near like 50 to 60% in that range is all, are always from universities. Uh, we had 
from government institutions and and in there you can think like national labs from like research labs for like nasa etc uh, and and that's again pretty consistent we had seven percent from foreign pis and two percent from industry and as i mentioned this is all like, these charts always look very similar with small variations from year to year the acceptance rate for non-renewals was 50 percent um, again that is higher than it has been historically it's related to the 2x oversubscription. What you normally see in there is like the 30, 35% numbers. And I think that is more realistic to expect for next year. This is a breakdown on the projects awarded last year. So there were Summit, Frontier, Theta, and Polaris. And just to make sure this is clear, you'll be, we'll dive into this a little bit more. Summit and Theta are not going to be available for 2024. There were 32 projects on Summit, 26 on Frontier. 12 each on Theta and Polaris. Those are a small number on Theta and Polaris. And really that's reflecting, you know, the fact that these are smaller systems. You will expect to see numbers closer to the 26 and 32 on some, on Aurora when that, when that becomes available later in 2024. One thing I haven't mentioned is that a project may absolutely request multiple resources. So we do have a lot of overlap, meaning projects that were requesting time on, on two or three resources across the program. And that is a completely reasonable thing. You just have to remember to make the readiness case. Like, why are you doing multiple systems? How does it fit into your flow as a project? The other key thing to take away here are the project sizes. This is a really important one when you're thinking about how you're going to write your proposal and give context for the amount of time that you're asking for. So the average size last year on Frontier was 765,000 node hours. The average size on Polaris was 168,000 node hours. If you are asking for something which is really substantially bigger than that, multiple times that, or substantially smaller than that, really think about why and how and your justification for a big award really just becomes that much harder if it's like three times the average award size it is again not impossible and i'm not saying you can't do it or that there's no chance for it but it becomes tricky for us so so really think about your justification and maybe use these as guides as you're thinking about what you might be able to realistically get in terms of time for an individual year some other statistics that I think are valuable is to understand that 31% of the PIs last year had never led an insight proposal before. The reason I bring this statistic up is to make sure people are aware this is there's a lot of overturn. There's a lot of room for new PIs to move in, um, move into this process and, and engage in insight. And 29% of non-renewal projects were awarded to new PIs. So this is this, these are great numbers sort of demonstrating that we really do have new people coming in and engaging and being successful with the projects, with the program. I've mentioned the science panels, the peer review, right? These are the folks we bring together uh, for a few days in September to discuss all of the proposals. We do organize those, those experts by domain, by, you know, by problem type fundamentally. Last year we had 92 scientists and engineers and, and domain experts. They are from a wide variety of backgrounds. They are pretty prestigious uh, with some with some substantial credentials behind many, many of those reviewers. What we try to do is have carryover from one year to another. We don't have 100% carryover, so we do sort of renew and refresh the panels as we go forward and even rethink the structure of the panels. But we try to bring some PI, sorry, some reviewers across the years to give some consistency, to give the, you know, even a sense of picture and history within that panel. The other thing to keep in mind is that when appropriate proposals may be assessed by multiple panels, right? So your proposal, if it's relevant, might be looked at in the biology panel, but it also might be looked at in the learning panel, or you might have a proposal that's looked at in astrophysics and in plasma as well. Uh, so, so it's not, the majority of proposals, but we absolutely have times where we're trying to get multiple perspectives on a proposal before we move forward. A few years ago, we introduced the early career path for insight. 
the premise was to support researchers who are early in their career to make sure that they had a landing place, right? To feel like they had a chance to come in and compete in, in, in many cases against, you know, people who might even have been their, their advisor, right? Um, and, and so what we do is commit 10% of our allocatable hours to the early career path. We're looking for folks who are less than 10 years out from their PhD, but who do need leadership computing facility capabilities. And, and fundamentally, right, this is a way to potentially increase an early career person's probability of getting an award. I will say we need, you know, the peer review to be solid on that proposal. We need the computational readiness to be solid on that proposal, but it's it's a way for us to make sure that we are fostering the next generation of researchers and potential insight PIs as we go forward. There's not it's not hard to identify yourself for this. There's literally just a checkbox in the application process and and give and give your year of graduate of of receiving your PhD and then a few sentences about the impact that this will have on your research path and your career path. All right, I, I will be turning over to my compatriots in a few minutes, but I really wanted to emphasize something that we are at three systems for the next three years. So OLCF will have Frontier, Polaris, and Aurora will be at the ALCF. When you are writing your proposal, you can ask for three years on these systems. We, as, as of right now, there are no other systems that are gonna come into the pipeline or leave the pipeline. Uh, and this is a difference, as I mentioned, Summit and Theta, which were both very popular machines, um, have reached the end of their life and are going to be retired. So keep this in mind. We'll dive into details about these facility, about each one of these systems. So what I will say is that not everyone might, uh, not everyone at all, has access to Aurora. Uh, there might even be folks who have not gotten a discretionary award on Frontier. Although I strongly recommend, if you're targeting Frontier, that you do that immediately. But there are some best practices for estimating your time based on what you want to run on. So if you do not have access, you know, you want to target a system but benchmarking your code on a system that is as close as possible. So for example, for Frontier, get your performance timings, you know, using an AMD GPU machine, um, otherwise sort of a comparable in terms of scale and capability. For Aurora, we'll dive into that in a little bit more detail. But fundamentally, what we're asking for is if you can run your timing tests, your benchmarks on your system of interest, if you cannot do something as similar as possible. For, for something like Aurora, we have guidance specifically if you get time on Polaris, how to make that conversion from Polaris to Aurora. What it is is a broad estimate, right? This is just like a, a very cursory estimate of how to do that conversion factor. Say you have Polaris times, we're gonna say just estimate, you know, that the Aurora will be a two to one win on the node side over Polaris. This is not necessarily real. Um, it's, it's something so that people can be consistent in how they're asking. It's not completely off of reality uh, for what someone might get in their first year on the resource. But this is our guidance right now. It will keep things consistent and less confusing. If you are a PI who has access to some of the early hardware through either ECP or ESP, you may absolutely use those timings. I encourage you to, um, but they're still sensitive, right? So reach out to your contacts at the ALCF and we'll make sure that we have a, a way to fold those in appropriately to your assessment of time. All right, and with that, I will hand over to Mark to talk in more detail about Frontier. Thank you. So Frontier is now available. Um, we have active projects running on it. It's our 1.5 exaflop machine, our newest machine at OLCF. Again, like all the other machines that we've had lately, it's a heterogeneous architecture with CPUs and GPUs. In this case, each node consists of one AMD CPU and four MI250X GPUs. Each GPU has two GCDs. So it looks to most users like an eight GPU uh, node. It has quite a bit of memory, uh, both in terms of the DDR4 as well as the high bandwidth memory. There are roughly 9,000 nodes. Um, and there's a lot more information available on our web page. I've included two link links below. 
Uh, the first is sort of the landing page for Frontier, but if you want more technical information, I really recommend looking at the Frontier user guide. It'll have details on the architecture, the software environment, uh, applications that are installed, and so forth. And I think, yeah. Tom, you want to take it? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mark and Catherine. Um, so I will talk about the resources at ALCF and then uh, get into the description of um, some guidance in terms of preparing your proposal. So um, we, we have at ALCF uh, the Polaris system. This is available now. Uh, Polaris is an HPE system with the system peak of 44 petaflops, um, has two different has DDR and HBM memory. Um, the node performance is 78 teraflops per node in double precision. Um, each node has uh, a single um, AMD Epic Milan processor with 32 cores and four NVIDIA uh, A100 GPUs. There are 560 of these nodes. Um, and uh, as I said, it's available now. If we look at the um, at the programming environment details on the next slide, please. Um, Polaris is uh, was intended as a system that we could use as to to onboard people for Aurora. And so many of the things that you'll see here in terms of software that's on Polaris today, you'll see repeated in the in a similar slide for Aurora. In terms of the programming environment. Um, we have a Cray programming environment. We have the NVIDIA HPC SDK um, and Sickle and DPC++, which will be the model uh, in, coming from Intel for Aurora. Um, programming models include OpenMP 4.5 and 5, um, DPC++ and Sickle, as I, as I said above. And then uh, more portable programming models like Cocos and Raja and HIP, if you're coming from an AMD system, um, might be familiar to you as the AMD um, version of CUDA support. In terms of uh, performance tools and profiling and debugging, we have pretty much the tools that you expect to see on these systems, um, PAPI, Tau, and HPC Toolkit, uh, NVIDIA tools like Ensight and CUDA GDB, and then more standard CPU tools like uh, standard GDB. Um, we're targeting uh, data, a lot of data science workloads. So there is also uh, Python and Numba, of course, TensorFlow and PyTorch for uh, deep learning with neural networks, um, and an AI stack from Cray HPE, including hyperparameter optimization support, uh, Jupyter, and the Spark Big Data stack. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide describes Aurora, which uh, it will be allocated in the second half of the insight year. Uh, Aurora will come in at at least two exaflops in double precision. Uh, each node will have two uh, Intel Xeon Max processors and six uh, Intel Data Center GPU Max GPUs. Um, <clears throat> the CPU GPU interconnect will be uh, PCIe, and between GPUs, there will be an XE link. Um, the storage for Aurora will be more than 230 petabytes. Um, and uh, at more than 25 terabytes per second using the Deos file system. The programming models are uh, as described on the next slide. We'll come to that in more detail. Um, I just, uh, the one other point there from the last slide was that the node performance comes in at about 130 teraflops. And overall, Aurora will have uh, at least 10,000 nodes. Now we can go to the next slide. So this slide, as I said, looks very similar to the one we looked at with Polaris. The key differences here are that where on Polaris we have NVIDIA GPUs and therefore uh, various versions of NVIDIA supported software for 
compiling and um, debugging and profiling. Here we see more Intel-based tools to support the Intel GPUs on Aurora. Um, I don't need to walk through, I think, all of these in detail, but you can see that in terms of uh, compilers, uh, programming languages, um, and support tools and frameworks, we have uh, good coverage over all of these spaces with the intention that we'll be able to support um, both simulation applications and deep learning and data applications. Next slide, please. So in preparing your proposal, uh, as Catherine mentioned, um, there's some key questions you should ask yourself. So for these systems, we're really looking for, uh, for science that can't be done anywhere else. And that comes down to a couple of different things. One is if you can't get the amount of time that you need anywhere else, then that justifies your use of these systems. And if your applications, your runs are too large to run on other systems, then that is also a justification. Uh, um, another question is whether you need the specific hardware that we have or the specific uh, support that we have on these machines. That can mean very large memory and I.O. It can mean that you need access to the accelerators that we have on these systems, be they uh, the AMD GPUs on Frontier or the Intel GPUs on Aurora or NVIDIA on Polaris. Um, mixed and reduced precision also plays a role here and uh, of course can justify your need for the systems. Um, do you have the people ready to do the work that you're proposing? If you're waiting to hire a postdoc and that would be a blocker in your proposal, then that would clearly be a, a, a problem. Um, better is that you have commitments from all of the named major participants in the proposal. Uh, next slide, please. So continuing, a uh, good question is whether you have large data or AI needs this is increasingly true, whether you are uh, proposing specifically a data intensive task or perhaps combining simulation with AI. In both cases, uh, it might look different from traditional simulation only applications. Um, if you are proposing um, a project that involves chaining together multiple steps, do you have a solution for that that supports you running that workflow on the systems? Um, do you have a post processing strategy? Um, do you use ensemble runs? Uh, in some cases, if you have ensemble runs and you have a good handle on uh, how to run those jobs and how you'll deal with the I.O. during those jobs, then it's possible, uh, it's a better case that um, you know, your proposal would score higher. If you're simply proposing to run millions of serial batch jobs, uh, it's less likely that your proposal would score well. And lastly, do you understand the life cycle of your data? Um, so this can mean uh, bringing in large data sets um, for data, data intensive projects. It can mean uh, data management while your simulations are running. And what happens when you're finished, whether there's subsequent analysis, whether you plan to share the data, how long you need to keep it, uh, whether on disk or on tape, and what will happen with it um, if it leaves the facility. Um, and the, the note up here on the right is just saying some of these things are negotiable. So I think in general, as you're going through this process, if you have questions, if things seem unclear, we definitely encourage you to ask um, because some things are negotiable or in general, it's better to uh, clarify those questions up front and address them in your proposal rather than subsequently. Uh, next slide, please. So the outline for the proposal is um, in general here, but what we will talk about is this number four project narrative. Um, this structure 
is all laid out on the Insight website where there are templates that describe each of these sections. Uh, so we can continue with the project narrative on the next slide. So as a starter, uh, and, and anytime that you're writing, whether it's an insight proposal or a different proposal or a paper, it's good to know your audience. And in this case, you should know that your audience is a collection of uh, scientists and engineers from academia and research who understand computational science and understand their field. And it's very likely that uh, people reviewing your proposal are familiar with your science and are familiar with uh, the systems that we will be allocating. And so they will have a good perspective on the problem and how to address them. Um, they'll also, because of that, be familiar with the potential impact of the work, not only coming from your proposal, but also um, in the context of other proposals that are being submitted and other work that has been done in past years as we have um, carryover of reviewers across insight years. Um, having said that, again, referring to these tips on the right, um, there may not be a perfect fit between reviewers and the content of your proposal. So you need to strike a balance in terms of uh, describing the details of your science and the computation, um, but uh, you know, in sufficient detail, but also don't make assumptions about how much they, the, the reviewers will know. So if you should give a full uh, description of your, of your problem so that um, it can be understood by someone who is maybe uh, uh, one step away from your science domain. Um, and importantly, uh, on the Insight Proposals website, there is a list of the questionnaires that reviewers will follow in reviewing your proposal. And so uh, getting to know them and how they will review your proposal obviously will help you to score better. Uh, next slide, please. So in the narrative, you clearly want to describe the impact of the work. Um, the impact of the work is uh, the key determinant of um, having a successful proposal. Uh, we're seeking major scientific advances. And so you want to call out what is the challenge? What is its significance? Um, what will be the impact of it if it succeeds? Um, and why, not only why does it need to be done, but why does it need to be done now and on the requests that we're allocating in this case? Um, you can talk about uh, the, the impact of the work within your field, and if it's appropriate, then um, beyond your field. And again, explain why it can't be done anywhere else. Uh, reviewers will be aware of other allocation programs and whether they might be a better fit. Um, but we're talking about insight, and if you're proposing to insight, then uh, that's what you should be aiming for. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of objectives and milestones, so you'll talk about the impact of your of your uh, the, the work in your proposal, but breaking that down into objectives and milestones um, that uh, are steps toward achieving the overall goal of your proposal is uh, helpful for reviewers in understanding how you will proceed, um, what preliminary results you might uh, generate, and uh, how they relate to the the runs that you are proposing and the number of hours that you're proposing. And this is helpful to reviewers in terms of um, if, if they can't award all of the hours that you've requested, then they have some way of, of preserving the uh, a larger part of the goals of your proposal if they have to cut some of the hours that you've requested. Um, and we always like to remind people that while uh, an insight time on insight systems um, is awarded for free to your 
project, the value of that time is uh, on the order of millions of dollars. So it's a significant award, even though it's not a monetary award. Uh, next slide, please. In the computational approach, you want to describe the underlying formulation. So from the overall science objective to the codes that you will use to achieve them and the algorithms that are in use and talk about uh, how that's implemented in the code. We will come later to performance. Um, you should show that the code you're planning to use is the correct tool. Um, and that's uh, you know supporting your own code, but also discussing how alternate codes might um, be less applicable. And if you're using a version of a code that's well known with some differences that you've made to it, then you should explain those differences. Uh, we'll all depend on different programming languages and libraries and tools. And in these slides, we tried to make clear a lot of the details of support that's available on different systems. Um, and if there's anything missing from there, there are also links that lead you to more details for those systems so that you know what you need is available on the system. Or if it's not, that there are some parts of the, the support that you need that you will have to build yourself. And it's good to call that out as well and to make it clear that you have that under control. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of uh, data management, we talked about data life cycles. So this is related to that in terms of bringing data in, how much storage you will need, how you will move data uh, onto the system, how long it needs to stay on disk and archive, and how you establish that. Um, Long-term use of the data, we, we do have projects and uh, support for um, sharing data sets that were created either within your community or uh, publicly. And so it's good to describe, you know, which um, direct data products or derived data products might fit into these categories and for how long you would need to make them available. Um, and the tools or infrastructure that you would need to make that happen. Again, uh, we do have various facilities for publishing data uh, in a constrained way or in a public way, typically using Globus. Um, in terms of data and AI, <clears throat> there are projects that are completely about data and AI and some that are combining simulation and AI. And uh, in either case, you should describe those parts of your project and how you expect them to be done. Um, also called out here is visualization. So that's a uh, some additional um, analysis work that you might need to describe in your proposal. Um, and if there are workflow tools that you use, then also uh, describe those as we've said before. Next slide, please. So when it comes to describing the, the campaign of runs that you'll make, it might be that you start with some exploratory runs using say some number of nodes for some number of hours in advance of moving on to the big runs which consume the larger part of your allocation. Um, you should describe these things separately and you know also describe analysis runs that would be made. Um, and we talked about AI runs also if there are if there are also runs like that that factor in here then they can be called out separately. Um, and again, we'll come to performance in just a moment. Um, in any case, in, in all of these runs, you'll have some aspects of data that you need to deal with. Uh, and if those are bottlenecks, you should show that they're bottlenecks and show that you understand the size of the results that you expect and that you have it under control, how you will, how you will deal with those. Uh, these are very important details. So um, this full progression from your science objectives 
into how you will achieve them, how many hours that equates to, um, and all of the details of the data and the results are really the meat of the proposal and understanding that you have this all under control. So please do be careful in terms of um, describing fully uh, how your objective is supported by the computational runs that you intend. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of code performance, uh, so in some cases, uh, you may have already access to the system that you're proposing on. Uh, that might be true on Frontier or Polaris. Uh, that was less likely to be true on Aurora, although some of you may have uh, already been running on the pre-Aurora system Sunspot. Um, you should use a problem that is representative of what you expect to run. Um, when specifying the performance that your code achieves. Uh, you should demonstrate scaling uh, that, you, that shows that you can get to the range of nodes that you require in your production runs and demonstrate that you use individual nodes uh, efficiently, um, both the CPUs where appropriate and the GPUs on the system. It's best, like I said, to run on the same machine, but uh, if you don't have access to that machine, you can run on uh, similar machines, comparable machines to some degree, and run similar sized runs as what you plan to, as what you're proposing. Um, and be clear about the breakdown of your runs. So in terms of the number of nodes, MPI ranks, threads, GPUs, how you are coordinating the use of uh, all the hardware on a node, um, and include production style IO and benchmarks. So in all of these cases, we're trying to make the point that the example that you give in your proposal in terms of demonstrating the performance of your code should mirror what you expect to happen in production. And if there are any deficiencies in terms of scaling, you can describe how you will address them. Uh, on the next slide, we give an example of how to describe scaling in your proposal. So typically we talk about this in terms of weak scaling and strong scaling, uh, probably very familiar terms to everybody on the call, but we'll just go over them in terms of how we expect to see them and evaluate them in the proposal. So in weak scaling, uh, we as we add work, we add processors and so the problem size increases as resources are increased. And in the plot on the left, in the weak scaling example, you see that the ideal scaling is that the time to solution remains constant as we add work and add, um, add nodes. Uh, and you can see from the, from the red line on the plot that with increasing scale, uh, the weak scaling uh, efficiency declines or more accurately, the time to solution increases. This can be due to a number of factors in terms of how you're using the nodes or uh, data contention. And these are factors that you should demonstrate and call out. Um, in terms of strong scaling, we're taking a fixed problem size and running on an increasingly larger number of nodes, in which case we expect the overall time to solution to go down. So in the plot on the right, you see the black line showing ideal scaling with increasing number of nodes with the time to solution going down. And you see as of about a thousand uh, nodes, that the red line starts to pull above the ideal scaling. And so um, there's a, a loss of efficiency in the strong scaling example above that scale. Um, in these examples, we're using time to solution. That may not be the factor that you use in your proposal or in your work. And so the axes could be something else like samples per second um, or throughput. And for uh, data or AI applications, it might be some other factor such as um, uh, time to convergence for an AI model. And it might de depend on various factors such as hyperparameters. And you can talk about the impact of that on your um, 
your problem. Um, next slide, please. We talked uh, a little bit about ensembles already. So again, uh, if in many cases, what we see are large scale parallel jobs that are requiring 20% or more of these systems um, for a single run. Uh, but we definitely see other projects that just need to run um, a collection of smaller jobs. It might be that you're running many hundred node jobs, for example, or a thousand node jobs. Um, in some cases, you're running single node jobs. Uh, if, in, if you're running um, loosely coupled jobs and you just can't keep up with the, it, it would take an unrealistically long time for you to run that elsewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and you have control over that in terms of a workflow solution or um, running that efficiently on our systems, then possibly, yes, that would be a good, a good use case for these systems. Um, if you can run the work in a way that it could effectively be done on a smaller machine in a reasonable amount of time, uh, then probably uh, your proposal would score less well. Um, then the tips on the right, identify frequently asked questions. So again, on the Insight um, uh, website, the link is at the bottom right. Um, you can look at the FAQ for more details about um, ensemble jobs. Next slide, please. So for data and AI applications, um, this is something we, over the past few years, we have been encouraging. Of course, we're all aware of the rise of uh, AI and science. Um, and uh, example areas in this case are, of course, machine and deep learning, um, but also data intensive computing coming from, uh, say, experimental or observational uh, work at different facilities. Um, complex and interactive workflows are a different type of uh, workload from the traditional simulation applications. If you're doing streaming or real-time data analysis or statistical methods, graph analytics, there are these variety of factors that are more data uh, intensive than they are simply simulation intensive. And we're seeing more and more of this uh, type of project in proposals. And so I just, we, we encourage this. Um, if you are proposing in these areas and you have any questions, we're happy to hear from you and, and discuss them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in that context, uh, you should, successful proposals will, uh, you know, we've mostly been following the the theme of simulations, but um, in terms of data and AI applications, you could talk about the objectives and dependencies of the entire campaign, which might include uh, training data requirements. If you have to generate training data from simulations, for example, um, you can talk about uh, how you will select and validate your model. Um, and whether it's if it's an AI plus simulation proposal, how you might embed the model with your simulation um, to, to, to speed it up or um, replace the simulation even. Uh, you should list application requirements, including databases and deep learning frameworks and workflow software. Um, these are called out specifically just because these things are more likely to show up in data and AI applications. And of course, show that your software can run efficiently on the, on the resources that you're requesting. Um, and again, we uh, encourage simulation plus AI plus data applications. And again, there's more detail in the fact about these, um, about these types of applications. Uh, and I think on the next slide, I will hand it over to Mark to discuss uh, development work and continue with the proposal prep. Thank you, Tom. 
So in your narrative, please be sure to discuss your development work that's required for the proposal. So this would be any development work that's required to execute any of the milestones, including the out year milestones. Uh, please be sure to include any uh, and identify any and all dependencies on that development work and how you'll validate. Um, again, this really helps us determining the risk of the proposal and which milestones and help ensure that the project stays on track. Please accurately estimate the computational resources required for the development work and when it will be complete. Next slide, please. Please include the uh, management plan. You'll find the templates uh, with all the other templates on our website. This will include the scientific and technical members of the team and their experience and proposed tasks. Uh, it should show that the team has a clear understanding of uh, petascale and now exascale computing and how to use the resources required to accomplish their tasks. And it should clearly identify uh, what team members are responsible for uh, for each part of the proposal. Team members may be part of multiple proposals and projects that involve multiple teams or different trust areas should clearly state how the allocation will be distributed and managed uh, amongst those resources. Do include uh, in the personal justification a brief description of each role member. Um, if we don't understand who will be doing the work, for example, for development, uh, that can negatively impact the reviews. Next slide, please. The milestone table is a very important part of your proposal. It should clearly state the uh, scientific and technical milestones for each year of your proposed work. Uh, you may have multiple, multiple milestones uh, for each given year. Uh, this is particularly true of larger projects where they may have a number of project milestones. For each milestone, there's a, a number of details, including the computing resource, the allocation requ request size for that milestone, the number of production runs, the size, storage requirements, and software, et cetera. Um, again, you'll find the template online. Please use this template. Uh, this table allows us to very easily see where the milestones are, what the dependencies are, and the resources associated with individual milestones. And it is required and proposals without it will not be accepted. Next slide, please. Of course, we ask that any publications resulting from insight work uh, acknowledge the use of the resources. Uh, this includes listing the publications uh, from previous insights, including DOIs, as well as including the appropriate acknowledgements of the Insight program or the appropriate leadership computing facility. Um, only include publications with Insight acknowledgements within your proposal, uh, within this portion of the uh, proposal. Next slide, please. This is a rough estimate or rough timeline for the Insight proposal process. Right now we are in solicitation of new and renewable proposals uh, that will last through uh, June or July for new or renewal proposals respectively. We will conduct a computational readiness review and the scientific peer panel reviews um, more or less concurrently, uh, followed by selection and awards decisions. Awards will be announced in late December and that'll be followed by application processing and then access on January 1st uh, for the appropriate resources. Um, of course, if you recall, uh, in the case of Aurora, that will not, not be available on January 1st. Next slide, please. So are you ready to apply now? Uh, it, you should have, you should already port your code before submitting your proposal. Um, for community codes, this may be a simple matter of seeing if someone else has already ported it. If you haven't already, you really should request a startup director's discretionary account at the facility where you intend to run. Uh, this allows you to perform your benchmark data and scaling on ideally the machine of choice in the case of Polaris and Frontier. In the case of Aurora, it would I would still recommend getting a director's discretionary at the ALCF 
uh, so that you can become familiar with the software environment on Polaris, for example, as well as the center uh, policies. All example cases should be proposed, should be run at production scale. And if you can't show proof of runs at the production scale, then you really need to have a very tight discussion on how you will succeed at running at these re on these resources. Do make sure that the benchmark examples are as close to your production runs as possible. Uh, this is particularly a problem for large code bases that have lots of different possible codes or modules within them. Uh, you want to make sure that the timing results you're presenting uh, and use for your own calculations in terms of estimating your resources are as accurate as possible. Next slide, please. So as stated, you really should, if you haven't already, request a director's discretionary account. These may be submitted anytime year round. Uh, they're a much easier application than an inside proposal or ALCF a proposal. And of course, they're a much smaller allocation as well. Uh, one of the primary purposes of a director's discretionary proposal is for porting, tuning, or scaling runs in preparation for an insight uh, proposal. So you are free to do all the scaling runs within the DD, and we encourage that. Uh, it does take some time to sometimes process all the paperwork and get them approved. So I do recommend applying for them as early as possible. Uh, certainly no less than two months before the insight call to allow you time to actually get your uh, uh, necessary results. And there are links for both the uh, DD programs at the ALCF as well as the OLCF at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So a final checklist, uh, make sure your project contains the executive summary, narrative, the justification and management plan, the milestone tables, the publications resulting from previous insight awards, and your PI and co -I bi biographical sketches. Next slide, please. And at this point, I'll return the meeting back to Catherine for questions. And we will, we do have a little bit more, but we, you know, that's a big dump of a lot of information. So we want to make sure to give a pause if anyone would like to ask. So you can unmute and ask if you would like. You can also put it in the chat and I will I will read it. All right, I will keep going. Again, feel free to drop them in the chat as I'm wrapping up. And um, and obviously we will have another opportunity when I finish. So the, the first thing is submitting your proposal or your renewal. They, uh, you will need to get a PeerNet account. So our proposals are collected using PeerNet. The, um, the link for that is, is all on doeleadershipcomputing.org. And I would recommend if you're considering submitting a proposal, going about getting your account and setting that up. You can save your proposal at any time. So you can go in and start mucking around and exploring it and, and you can save any progress and go back and edit it. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's useful to know that even if you submit your proposal, so you believe you're done, you submit it and you're like, er, no, wait, I have you know some better data or something akin to that. Up until the deadline, you can always go back and edit that proposal, even if it's submitted. So the submitted proposal, you know, would be official, right? Come, come the close of the call, but you have that opportunity to go back and edit. So we we have found that useful for many people to be aware of. I will say there there are required fields as you're walking through PeerNet to do the submission, right? There's the primary thing, which is your PDF, but there are additional questions we ask as you are going through. The, the submission process. I, I will say we will probably follow up with you if there are things that are incomplete that we really do need. I will also ask to pay attention to the accuracy. So in many cases we have, uh, because we do allow someone to be the author, like sort of being the, the submitter of the proposal and they are not the PI. So I ask people just to be aware of, you know, the accuracy and what they're filling out. When I say they're filling out for the PI, make sure it's the PI, 
even if you are the author, we track that as well and ask for it. So as I mentioned, what happens when we finish with the review, the decision process is made up by, by this team I had mentioned earlier in the talk, which is the Insight Program Manager, the directors for the two LCFs, the directors of science for the two LCFs, and then other members of senior management as, as is necessary. We primarily look at the top ranked proposals from the panel rankings. So we actually ask the panels as they are completing their reviews to consider a, all of the proposals and to make us a ranked list of the top priority proposals, the good, good proposals, but not as top priority, um, and the proposals that they think are not meritorious. We look at those as the primary mechanism for how we make our decisions. And we roll into that, you know, aspects of the specific reviews, rankings, the reports. Um, we might be looking into considerations if we're trying to promote the use of HPC resources by underrepresented communities um, or even by early career, as I had mentioned before. And the computational readiness review really is not the deciding factor. It is a driver in risk assessment. It can break a proposal. It won't make a proposal that is not meritorious, but it can break a proposal if the, the readiness is completely not there. But it is not the driver. When we make the awards, I, I had mentioned earlier that there is no explicit quota, there is no, and there is not. We do try to strike a balance. So, you know, we we try to make sure that there is a portfolio of different types of work happening at the facility. That does not necessarily mean that it's always X percent astrophysics and X percent bio and X percent chemistry. Um, it's really variable from year to year. But when we're looking specifically at each individual project, we're really trying to make sure that you are awarded the time you are asked, making sure that you have the time, right? The sufficient allocation to enable the proposed scientific achievements. It is true that we might even get guidance from the science panel that they really like part A of the proposal. They have a lot of questions about part B, but part A is awesome and they wanna see that going and we'll follow that guidance. So we might award you the time to do part A and, and suggest that part B is, is going to be removed from your milestone table, that you remove part B from the milestone tables. Um, the other component to this is that we are oversubscribed, right? And, and while it wasn't the, at some years we are incredibly oversubscribed. So we do make a point to award the time that the project needs. Our goal is not to say, hey, yes, go tackle all your milestones, but we've shaved you 30%. We try to avoid that. And for the most part, we do. If we feel like perhaps because of feedback from the panelists or for other reasons, we need to make a more substantial cut, we might reach out to you to adjust your milestone table accordingly. You may submit appeals if you disagree with our decision. Almost always that would be if that is a result of being having your proposal declined. But primarily there, we are looking for an error in process. If there was just, for example, a clerical or procedural error, this is not reassessing the science review. We will be announcing those who are awarded in November of this year. So you should be receiving an email with a, a yes or no within the first couple of weeks of November. And immediately following that, you will receive startup information from the centers and just how to get going so that you are in a place to go January 1st, right? So that you're able to be on and, and start running jobs if you want to on January 1st. In addition to that, right, as you are awarded your project, the ALCF and the OLCF will reach out to you with your catalyst or liaison. And these are our computational experts. These are folks who are all are coming from you know, research in different domains in, in scientific computing. And they are there to help you as much as you need fundamentally, right? So you can you know, use them as little as you want, but you can also use them um, as a collaborator, help you be successful at the facility, but they are your go-to. They are your you know, personal concierge in some respects for, for using the, the leadership computing facilities. And I always wanna to touch on what your responsibilities are as a PI. So you do have some responsibilities. The first one is that we need 
reports like you know i think as pis you're probably all familiar with that but fundamentally we need to report and understand where you are so the first thing i'll, I'll go in backwards order we need to understand what problems you're having as a project um, what roadblocks you have and what successes you have as well that understanding right like if if we can't speak to why an inset project isn't using their time um, that is problematic for us, right? And, and more importantly, right, we want to make sure you are using your time. And if you're just frustrated because this piece of software isn't working, but you haven't communicated that to us, then it's really hard for us to do anything. So the first thing is we want to understand where you are. And so that's why we have quarterly reports. It's why we encourage you to talk to your catalyst or liaison. Um, the other component to the quarterly status updates is just an easy recurring mechanism for you to as I said, report problems, but also report successes. So if you have had publications or awards or paper, uh, posters, you know, related to the work that you're doing at the LCS, please encourage that. That is our currency back to our sponsors in the Department of Energy. That is how we demonstrate you know, real success and impact on our science mission is through the outcome of these projects. So please communicate those to us. You very likely will be hired, I mean, be hired. You will be very likely contacted by the LCFs for a science highlight if you are an Insight project, at least at some point. So <clears throat> again, this goes back to sort of what our currency is as we give updates to our sponsors about how the projects are doing, interesting papers that have come out. And we want to represent your science and research as accurately as possible. So we really need your input there. If you have been awarded, a multi-year award we do ask you know that you submit your annual renewal request and you complete that with due diligence uh it, it is true if you did not submit it you will not be renewed um so uh at, so if you are a project with multiple years and you have concerns um about whether you even should be renewed this goes back to something i said before please reach out to me and we can talk about talk about it and I also am going to encourage you and and your team members, you know, communicate this back to them to be good citizens on these systems. These are shared, right? It might not be tens and tens of thousands of people on the system trying to share it. You know, there's a smaller user base and some user facilities out there, but it is still a shared system. And so we ask that you consider that you consider, you know, the the spirit of the policies where we're trying to be fair. Um, and and you work with us. And as I already said, the biggest thing though is let us know your achievements, let us know your challenges. In the big picture, your achievements are super important to us, but we really want those challenges too, because that's how we can actually help you be successful. Uh, we want to hear those because we really do want to tackle it and and make you more effective at using the facilities. I would also encourage your, you or your team members to attend our centers, both facilities, in this case is overloaded, but our facilities meetings. So we have a lot of training opportunities, opportunities to either virtually or physically come to the facilities, meet other users and um, and learn something, right? And even maybe sit down with your catalysts or liaison. So I encourage you to do that. You can honestly normally pull out a lot that is is really helpful and perhaps um, effective in changing how you use the systems. And finally, I do want to point out that in publications um, that you do make that include time from either facility, we do have acknowledgement, acknowledgements, excuse me, that we need our users to include in the paper. Um, there's, you know, a short version of that, a longer one where we're specifically listing the contract, but these are, these are pretty important. So again, goes back to making sure that we track what output is coming from the facilities. And in a, in sort of a similar vein, what I want to point out is that it is a small world, uh, you know, supercomputing, even though, I don't know, sometimes it feels big, it is not, it is a small community. And if Insight and or the leadership computing facilities is having a good impact to your work, I encourage you to please let your, your agency or your program managers um, or your university know that, communicate that and um, 
And that helps everyone to be honest. And going back to a theme for the for the webinar today, I'm going to say, please contact us. Contact us with questions. That's how we improve the program. It's how we help you. We do want you to be successful. Um, please contact us. And this will also go through as you're using the facilities. I do see a question here. Um, for those using DD, is there a specific acknowledgement wording? There is. Um, and it's it's actually on our website. And um, as you get the DD, you will be you will be pointed to that. So all right. And that is all I had for today. Here are just some contact in, pieces of contact information um, for both the Insight program and the facilities. Insight at DOE will go to the team that helps me run the program. Um, so everyone will see that. And specific ways to contact both facilities. So these help at olcf.ornl.gov and support at alcf.anl.gov. These are our primary mechanisms. You know, you can ask any question of either of those paths and, and you will be routed to the right people. And, and again, we've sort of repeated the links here for the director's discretionary time. So thank you. I really am grateful you're here. I hope this was useful information. Going back to the feedback, you know, and hearing from you, if there's something else you would have rather hear, have heard in a webinar, I I invite that feedback too, because we we've, we've been giving something similar each year, right? You know, and and if you are really missing something in this, I'd love to know, and we can accommodate that for the future. Any qu other questions? Yes, Abhishek. Yeah, hi. Um, I had a question about sort of the uh, accompanying machines that come with with these. Uh, so I think Summit, for example, had um, the Andes machine as like sort of a pre-post processing uh, system. Um, and so what's the situation for uh, for the machines for this allocation? Um, so I'll speak for ALCF. Um, Mark, feel free to, to chime in for OLCF. You're right. The facilities are not just like the big, big, big resources. There's a lot of other machines that surround them that support them. So for example, for the ALCF, in addition to the AI test bed, which some people exploit pretty heavily, we have a data and visualization resource um, and other like smaller resources that people can explore. So Cooley for, is, a, is our data and visualization resource. Um, although that will be migrating to Polaris as Aurora ramps up, but but in the meantime, it's still going. Mark, did you want to speak to that? Yeah. So at OLCF, Andes is still our data analysis visualization cluster, um, and it's available to Insight projects. And we now have our new file system, Orion, which is uh, much larger capacity, I think something like 600 petabytes. So all Insight projects will have access to those resources as well. And actually, Mark, I appreciate that because I forgot one other. I forgot what crucial one, and I, I'm hitting myself. One of the other things that the ALCF is our community data file system. So there's the large scale file system that we have that that supports the work. Um, but Grand and Eagle also can support files data sharing sort of externally, like with people not at the facility itself. And so this is an option for any Insight project. They can ask for that specifically if there are data sets that you know you're going to want to be sharing publicly. So that is sort of a, an additional window into the facility and resource that we encourage people to consider how they might use. To give an opportunity for other questions to maybe percolate up and I'll stop if somebody's hand raises, so don't, don't worry. Um, earlier, some folks might've seen the chat, in the chat, someone asking about um, CPU only projects. And I did want to touch on that verbally in case anyone missed it, but also just to sort of note, we understand <laughs> that, that especially if you have an application that is CPU only, the loss of theta is really hard. It is really not avoidable. The, the fact that we are really migrating all the systems to be accelerated in, you know, in the sort of hybrid heterogeneous way that we are with um, with GPUs. The best I can say is if you do not have your application 
able to use GPUs in any way, shape, or form yet is to reach out to the facilities. We have a lot of people, experts who have experience accelerating project uh, applications that are not already accelerated and collaborating with people. We have a lot of training material. Uh, I don't want to diminish, you know, and say that, you know, diminish it and just say, you know, I'll reach out. We've got stuff you can read. I realize everybody, you know, can do that, but we understand that. We understand the difficulty it presents, um, but please reach out because we can help you. The other component to that though, is we do require GPU usage out of projects. And so what that means is that, you know, you really do have to demonstrate some ability to offload some work to the GPUs to move your project forward. Uh, that does not mean that, you know, there might not be a sub component to your work that isn't CPU only. Um, if it's a lot of the work that might be problematic and, and again, go back to these conversations with the facility and, and having a sort of a detailed discussion about a path forward. But it is not uncommon for projects to engage with us, you know, you know, starting now to engage in the end in, you know, to say submitting a proposal for next year for Insight. So that is not beyond the pale, you know, it is it's very common. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, GPU machines have been around since Titan at the leadership computing facilities. Um, we have a number of training activities, hackathons that go on year round at all the centers, including other centers such as NERSC. Um, there's a lot of material out there and we work individually with projects at both centers. So please do reach out if you're concerned about how to port to GPUs because we can do more than just point you to a website. That's absolutely right, yeah. Yes, I see Hung. I, I hate mispronouncing names, but I probably am. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, I do. So, um, so we had uh, Insight Awards in like previous year on Summit, and we already I like, benchmark our codes on on Summit. Uh, but for this year, uh, do we have to port our codes to like finish porting our codes to AMD before the proposal and benchmark all of that, or can we reuse our previous scaling plot on Summit? Yeah. So our preference, and I'd say a strong preference, is that yes, you complete the porting and you benchmark on Frontier. Um, you know, from a risk point of view, that's our lowest risk. So that's why we, that's our very strong preference. We know for a number of reasons that's not possible for everybody. If you can do that, please do that. If you're unable to do that, then yes, you may use your scaling data on Summit. If you have even single node or single GPU performance data on Frontier, um, I would highly encourage you to include that within your proposal. If your porting is not complete, you need to really have a discussion of where your porting's at, how it's going to be complete in time, um, what work is left to be done, what porting models you're using, and all of those details in your proposal uh, so that we can really realistically assess the risk. If if the details aren't there, it's probably going to be assessed as riskier than it probably is. Um, I know there's maybe some he hesitancy to put sort of all the information there if you're not ready, but it really is worse to not include the information than it is to include it. Um, because if you don't have that information, our default position is likely to be, we're concerned you're not going to make it. Um, and you can... I was just going to say, Mark, I was going to add, right, like as Mark had mentioned earlier, even development, right, as, as a totally reasonable component of a milestone. And so if if you feel like that porting um, will even extend sort of into the bulk of the year, right, but there's other things you can be doing in parallel, you know, you it can, it can be in a milestone, right, and that helps really lay it out very clearly. Um, yes, absolutely. If, you're, if your porting effort extends into the the insight project year, you have a milestone for when that's complete, and then your other milestones depend on that, as well as listing any work that can go on concurrently. You know, we certainly we would like every project to start on January first, but we have projects that don't start on January first, and if we understand that they're not going to and why, you know, that helps us to reduce the risk because we can plan for that. Yeah. Um, the last thing I would just say is, 
reach out. If you are if you already have an insight proposal, you have a liaison, make sure they know where you're at in your uh, porting effort because they can communicate that to the decisions team. Yes. So please do. And if you don't have an insight project and you're in that boat, you can still reach out to the center and communicate that as well. We, we do want to, the computing evaluation is really about risk, as Catherine's mentioned many times. So we want to understand where you are, particularly with these new machines. And I'm sure uh, with Aurora, there are even more complications. So One thing I'll mention is that um, we will sort of start pushing this out after, after this webinar, but our goal is to have kind of a, not a webinar, but just some Q and A, you know, quick place where people can call in and specifically ask questions about their proposal. So like we're expecting to have sort of a, a set time on June 1st, um, in the afternoon where people can, as I said, call in. But there is nothing that should preclude you from emailing to me or Mark or the facilities before then and asking your questions. As I said, right, we, we want to help people get successful proposals in. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is literally why we are here. <laughs> so um, we really do want to help. So please reach out if you have questions that there will, that that window is going to be there um, no matter what on June, on June 1st, but, but you don't have to wait for it. It's not like we're saying this is, you know, these are office hours. Don't bug me outside of that. No, that's not the situation. <laughs> any, any time is fine. All right. If there are no more questions, I will again really thank you for coming today. Thank you for engaging and and being interested in insight. These slides are posted on our website now. We will post the vi the video of this specific webinar. So both webinars will be up. They're both very similar. <laughs> the, the slides are the same. The questions on the video are slightly different, of course, from last week. It's different humans. Um, but those the video will be up relatively quickly for for today so all of that material will be there and again i i thank everybody and really appreciate your time today <laughs>